Hi, John Taylor. It's so great to see you again. Hey, Tammy. Good to see you, too. <laughs> I'm excited because John will be joining the Super Saturday Recovery Summit on Saturday, April 17th. I have to get this right. So, so um, I'm excited to have him on that platform as well. If you're not familiar with Super Saturday Recovery Summit, every month we have a series of guest uh, uh, presenters who typically present to the to the professional community, and they come in and do um, topics on various things uh, for the general recovery um, community. Dr. Rob has been doing in the rooms for four years and has a Friday night group, Sex, Love and Addiction, and has a couple hundred people there regularly. And so he came up with the idea and we've been doing that. So uh, there's a wealth of information that has uh, been on that platform to the general recovery community. You can always email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I, at seekingintegrity.com for more information on that or anything else as well. So, okay, what's our topic today? Well, we're gonna we're gonna continue um, in the vein of how our our brains, our automatic brains, get in the way of um, being able to do good things in relationships with each other. Um, I don't know if I've I've talked about this before, um, but Stan uh, Tatkin talks a lot about how what's a feature for an individual is often a bug in a relationship, um, and that's. I'd say that's in the vein that we've been talking about the last few months. So today we're going to talk about uh, the role that memory plays in our relationships. And I'm going to talk really specifically about our arguments and even more specifically about the phenomenon of gaslighting. Um, Cause that's a huge thing for couples in recovery. So um, I'll, I'll start with letting you know that my stance on memory and relationships is that memory is problematic. Um, if you're trying to use it to, resolve relationship issues. Um, it's helpful to understand how memory works and how it comes about. Um, so we, we may like to think that uh, memory is our own personal video library in our head and that we record things exactly as they happen. Um, if you have a good memory, it means your recorder's fast. If you have a bad memory, it means your recorder's not fast. Um, that's actually not how memory works. Um, I think it's a miracle that anything even gets encoded in our brains that's remotely like what happened, <laughs> that's recognizable as what happened, because there's so many things that influence uh, the way our brains encode. Um, the emotional state that we're in when an event is happening has a huge influence on how we encode information and what we remember. Um, if you're in a stressful situation that's reminiscent of other stressful situations, um, the way that your memory forms around the situation today is more based on your memory of past uh, stressful situations than it is on, on what's happening today. Um, because our, our brains are always looking for efficiencies. And so when something is happening right now that's reminiscent, it'll plug it into those neural networks that already exist. Um, Memory is also changed each time we access it. Um, so, and that's state dependent as well. Um, when you, it, it, again, it's not like playing the video through and then putting the video away and the video is gonna be the same every time. Um, it's more like a soft clay sculpture. And every time you take it off the shelf, you're gonna be modifying it and you're gonna be putting it back. Um, this is something I rely on in my work with trauma survivors. Um, we hope that if we can create the right emotional set point in the moment and then access the traumatic memories, we change the nature of the traumatic memory, um, that is something that feels less dangerous, less acute, um, maybe more safe, more in the context of things. Um, so, so even our good memories, they get changed based on how and when and how we feel when we're accessing them. Um, Memory uh, is, like I said before, it's state dependent. So um, the aspect of a situation that we remember, we encode, um, will largely depend on how we feel um, in that situation. So for example, let's say that uh, you go to a circus back when circuses were a thing, and um, you watch an act of clowns juggling chainsaws. Um, let's say that you have a fear of clowns and you've watched a lot of Texas Chainsaw Massacres, so chainsaws are scary for you. That's not going to be a fun memory 
for you. Um, you you may have fear already of seeing clowns. The sound of the chainsaws may set you off. Um, let's say you're sitting next to a person who saw the very same show and their Uncle Bob was a clown who was hilarious and warm and loving. Um, and, you know, they, they grew up in the wilds of Canada um, chopping trees and, and harvesting lumber. And that was a really good memory for them. Totally different experience. They'll highlight different parts of the event. Um, you, you may talk to both people and wonder if they were even at the same event and they were. And neither one of them is remembering it wrong um, because memory is state dependent. Um, our memories uh, are almost always biased in our own favor. Um, so the way we tend to retell stories, the way we tend to remember things um, with a few exceptions, um, like I would say um, in uh, traumatic memory, um, sometimes even in, in memory having to do with addiction, we may cast ourselves in more of an unfair light. Um, the shame may amplify how awful we are. Um, but in general, our, our memories tend to bias uh, in our direction. Um, they tend to support me being a great person and you not being such a great person or others not being such a great person. Um, we also often mistake um, because a lot of our current interactions, um, our, our brains are energy savers. If, if we had to, I think I mentioned this in previous weeks uh, recently, if we had to figure things out anew every time, um, you would probably drop to the floor in exhaustion within the first couple hours of the day because it's really energy intensive for your brain to figure things out. So our brains automate things. Most of our experience and interactions today are based on our memories. Um, from the past. Um, so we can um, use memory to fill in the gaps and we can use memory to assign motive to someone that we're interacting with. Um, when the reality is the best we can figure out by observing somebody and interacting with them is when there's a change, but it's really, really hard to know. And I would say almost impossible to know why that change happens in a person. So let's say that you're talking to, um, uh, let, let's say that you are, you're out on the dating scene, um, you know, you've been through some awful relationships in the past, maybe even, you know, a recent dissolution of a, a long-term relationship. You're out on the dating scene and you are talking to somebody and you ask a question about what they do for work and they look down and they kind of shuffle their feet um, you may look at that and say, okay, well, this person just lied to me about uh, what they do for work because you know looking away is an evasion and shuffling your feet means that you're lying. My ex-spouse used to do that whenever he was lying to me about um, acting out. Um, you're pulling on that information for good reason. I've seen this before. Your brain does that all the time. Where have I seen this before? Where have I seen this before? However, the person may be looking down because eye contact is one of the most intense things that human beings do. Um, especially with somebody new, it can be overwhelming. Um, it may be that that person, maybe they're embarrassed by what they do for work. Oh, I manage a porta potty company or, or whatever that is. Um, point is, you don't know why you see what you see, even with someone that you know really, really well. Um, the, the tells we have on the outside, um, they're not always clear about what the motive is for the inside. So when we're relying on memory, we can tend to jump to motive when really all we're seeing is a change. Um, Short-term versus long-term memory also plays uh, difficulty um, in, in memory and relationships and how couples get hung up on memory. Um, neither system is really good at encoding accurate information. Um, and long-term memory has more of it. again, think about that really soft clay sculpture uh, metaphor. Long-term memory has been taken on and off the shelf a lot of times, so it's changed over time. Um, this is where when I'm working with couples, I tell them you need to repair things quickly and effectively um, because dealing with things in short-term memory is about a hundred times easier than dealing with them once they get into long-term memory. Um, when I work with couples in recovery and they've had a fight and you know it's been five days since they had the fight and then they come to session. 
Um, I know we're in for the long haul on this fight because five days is a really long time. There's a lot that's crystallized. It's um, connected with other problematic memories and we have a bigger job on our hands. Um, so um, relying on long-term memory and what happened in the past can be problematic with couples because the longer it's in your long-term memory, the more divergent your views will be on what happened because you've both taken it off the shelf and altered it more. Um, so let's talk, let's talk a minute about gaslighting because as I, I thought about, this is something generally in relationships that I think is important to know because a lot of us rely on memory, especially when we're not feeling safe with somebody. It's kind of our second best go-to um, as human beings. We're um, wired to connect in groups. And when that doesn't work, we're kind of left to our, you know, our outer cortex. I can figure out the world and I can make sense of this. Um, so especially in relationships where there's not a lot of trust or safety, we tend to rely on memory to try to orient and convince the other person um, that uh, they need to see things our way in order to, to get safety. Um, where gaslighting comes in, um, I would say gaslighting is a grotesque attempt to put fact over connection. Um, and I put fact in quotes there because in order for it to be gaslighting, um, the person who is uh, doing the gaslighting knows that what they're doing is untrue or knows that what they're saying is untrue. Um, by definition, it's not gaslighting when you may not realize that you don't have the whole truth. Um, it's not gaslighting to, uh, to say, no, I, I saw it this way, this is the way it worked for me. It's when I know that I'm deceiving you, that's gaslighting. And um, gaslighting is particularly damaging uh, for relationships because it gets into this memory system and it pits my memory against your memory. So, um, First of all, uh, like, like I've been making the case, memory is not a good uh, system to use when trying to figure out relationship problems, but it really gets this uh, crazy making um, going. So you already have a faulty system and I'm gonna make you more insecure in that faulty system and um, try to prove to you that I'm the one that we can rely on. So it's a big move away from this two person system at the end of the day, both of us really don't have the whole handle on what's happened. We actually have to work together to figure out what's going on between us and what we need. And it shifts all the power to one seat, which is inherently unsafe um, for both members of the relationship. Um, gaslighting is a demand that two parties adhere to the memory of one person, but it's not really a memory because that person is lying. Um, it also takes all of the emotion out of it. And we'll, we'll talk about that now. Um, if you want to have success in a two-person system, and this I would say is, is more geared to the folks here who are um, recovering from addiction, who are addicted themselves. Um, because in the balance of a relationship, when there's been secrets, especially sexual secrets and betrayal, that's an unfair system. And to get fairness back into the system, um, the one who's done the betraying, the one who's done the, the lying, the one who's done the gaslighting, um, it usually works best if they take the first steps into repair and mutuality. Because um, think about it, it, it balances the teeter-totter again, it balances the system. Um, if your spouse has been saying for years, decades, something this doesn't make sense to me um to sit back and rely on them to reach to you is is perpetuating imbalance is perpetuating unfairness um so when it comes to taking memory out of the system when i'm working with couples who who are are working through addiction recovery i'll say to the addict it's really important for you or it'll work best for you if you stop trying to rely on your memory and your account of events, not because it's inherently untrue, but because it's inherently unfair and it's not, it's not useful. So if you wanna be able to get around this memory thing, learn how to listen to and track the emotion behind what's being said, rather than um, trying to decide if you agree with what's being said or not. Most often that's the complaint I get from couples is I went to my partner and I said, this thing happened and I'm upset and they'll say, no, that didn't happen. 
And there may be legitimacy to that. Well, I don't remember it that way, or I didn't see it happen, but it's missing the whole point. The reason why I'm telling you this story is because it made me feel something. And I need your help with what I feel. So for example, let's say that you're in an argument with your significant other and you're holding your phone and in a moment of frustration, you toss it on the bed. And the next day as you guys are processing, your partner says it was really scary when you threw the phone, you were out of control. And you may want to say, I didn't throw the phone. I wasn't out of control. You're missing the, you're missing the point there. Your partner is saying, I was watching your movements minutely because this was really scary for me. When you made that sudden movement and the phone left your hand, I didn't know whether that was coming at me or going somewhere else. You see, memory and bringing memory into a conversation, I think, is more of a way to illustrate for our partner a feeling that we have not even a justification for why I'm feeling this. Um, so that's where a lot of couples that I, I work with, they get hung up on one partner or the other exaggerating the facts. Um, that's a, that is an issue, but when it comes to connecting emotionally, I think exaggeration of the facts is actually how we communicate emotion. Um, wow, that was really overwhelming for you. I didn't realize that I was so scary i didn't realize that my anger scared you so much um if you're caught in the memory trap um and again this is for for mostly for the addicts in the room take the first step here um and let me know how it goes my sense is that it will go better for you if you're caught in the memory trap in an argument with your partner ask your partner do you feel like i have your back right now do you feel like i want to be on your team um, most of the time, I bet they'll say no, especially if you're caught in the memory trap. Because again, you're doing that when, when we do the memory thing, we're saying, I can't rely on our connection. I'm going to have to rely on my recounting of things. And then follow it up with, well, what can I do to make sure that you feel like I have your back? And your partner may say something like, I want you to just listen right now. Or don't pick apart the story that I'm telling. Um, I want you to know how I feel. Or your partner may say, you know, in the you threw your phone scenario, I want you to promise me that you won't throw things again or you won't toss it, you won't do that again when we're arguing. That's really triggering for me. You know, maybe they had a parent who would check things when they're angry. Um, because that that's the heart of this. The reason why you guys would put enough energy into fighting the way that you do or disagreeing the way that you do. Um, is because at the end of the day, you really want somebody on your team. And maybe you want that person specifically on your team. Um, there are far more efficient and far, far better ways to get an alliance with somebody than browbeating them into remembering events the way that you remember events, or even seeing you the way that you see you. So that question, do you feel like I'm on your team and what can I do? Um, that can be a really, really good direct redirect. Um, I would also say for um, those of you who are, are working through addiction recovery um, in this, um, this is part of your amends. Um, the imbalance, I've kept things back. I haven't paid attention to your emotions. Um, you taking the first step to, all right, I can put facts aside and I can, I can get with how you feel. It's a really powerful step towards amends with a partner. Um, you're essentially saying nothing matters more than my connection with you. So if that means that I need to listen to you tell a story that I don't believe is true at all, but I listen and I get the feeling of what you're saying and I can sync up with the feeling of what you're saying, I'm showing you that nothing is more important in this world to me, even fact. Nothing is more important than my connection with you. And that's what I want to have. So that is uh, the role of memory in our relationships. Such good stuff. And I, you know, like I thought it was so good that you said memory is problematic because like, you know, we all do go off of, you know, my memory of this. And I've found um, for partners that, you know, when they have discovery, they are now questioning their memory on everything. So, um, you know, like, okay, I thought we were a happy couple and, you know, at, at this Christmas party or whatever, you know, like, like all of the things that they thought were happy and had joy and meaning, and now they're having to question all of that. So, you know, the layering back and going, you know, to what, um, 
you know, to previous memories, like you said, you know, we need to automate because otherwise, you know, we'll be exhausted. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense. I've had so many incidences, like you're talking about too, where, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, if there's two people, there's two lenses and the reality is probably somewhere in the middle, you know, because we have our lenses and, you know, how we see things. But I think that being curious of like, okay, you know, tell me, tell you know, like that incident with throwing the phone or dropping the phone or whatever, you know, like, you know, being, wow, you know, I can hear that that was scary for you. And I could see how that that would be, you know, I, that was not my intention, you know, I mean, having a neutral conversation rather than just going no I have to tell you you know this, you know this is what really happened you know mm -hmm. uh, but I was also thinking too that you know that you talked about um, wanting people to be you know we want to be on our you know I want you on my side I want you to I want you to step in and understand you know what was going on for me um, and how um, you know fighting about that and wondering if you know because I think when someone is completely detached they become indifferent and they just don't care they're not showing up and all that so so with the fighting, you know, if two people are both trying to get, you know, the other person on their side, to me, there's at least still some hope that, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to, you know, we're trying to find that come together moment. Yeah, I, I think 100% of the time, uh, when, when couples do that, they're starting in the right place. The reason why we end up diverging and that ends up hurting is because we take such an inefficient route. Um, it, it's like, you know, how many arguments have you been in over what actually happened and what didn't? How many times has that actually worked out? How many times have you actually argued it out to resolution and there's been more closeness? Probably almost never. Um, so it's, you know, it's like showing up to the Amtrak station to take a plane ride somewhere. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. It's not the right mode of conveyance. Um, getting hung up on memory and what actually happened is, it, it takes you in the opposite direction of connection because it misses the whole, what are you feeling? What happened for you? Why is this important to you? So we have a bunch of questions. So uh, the first one is how long is a therapeutic separation supposed to last? And when, how do you end it to try to reconnect with the hurt partner and family? So, so this apparently is from the, from the person, um, the addict betrayer or whatever. So. Yeah, um, there is no uh, how long it's supposed to last. Uh, as with most things in recovery, any time frame you're given, it's it's arbitrary. <laughs> um, it's it's like in um, it, it, it it's, it's a sufficient amount of time. So I, I generally say to couples, uh, we want to check in on how your separation is going at least every thirty days. Um, that doesn't mean it's over after 30 days. That means we're going to have a serious uh, reevaluation talk after 30 days. Uh, generally, what I see with couples is, again, an arbitrary timeline, a 90-day minimum is pretty important because uh, it takes a lot of time to settle. Settle from when, when I recommend therapeutic separations, it's because both parties are having a hard time uh, not getting entangled in each other's emotions. Um, so the point of the separation is to have some unwind come down time and some time to really get firmly back in contact with your own feelings and your own thoughts. Um, because in order to repair um, and in order to you know, move forward, you have to be able to tell each other the truth about what you're feeling and you have to be able to stay with the truth of what's going on for you regardless of how your partner feels about it. Um, that's hard to do if you're in this cycle where you're watching each other close. Did you like that? Did you not like that? Did that work for you? Did that not work for you? To the point where I'm not going to tell you what's going on with me because of because it upsets you. So generally, I see about a minimum of 90 days. Um, some considerations in coming back together is, first of all, if it's a therapeutic separation, that means you have a therapist, a couple's therapist, who is helping guide you through it. Um, don't do this on your own. It's like, it's like doing an appendectomy on yourself. It's not advisable. Yeah. Um, uh, so some things that I look for, I tell couples that the, um, you need to leave, or I need to leave in order to solve this problem. That's not a tool you can go to often and have your relationship not be damaged by it. So one of the things that I tell my couples, if you guys are considering reunification, are you in a place where 
another separation is right around the corner. Um, because if you are the yo-yo of in and out, in and out, that's really going to hurt you both. Um, so you want to make sure that safety concerns and safety issues are addressed sufficiently um, for, for addicts in recovery. If one of the reasons why you were asked to leave is because you couldn't stay sober to consider coming back home, you, you better, I think, have some ability to be able to remain sober for significant periods of time. Um, and um, some ability to be honest about your sobriety status. Um, I think the couple being able to clarify their goals on why they should be a couple is pretty important in considering coming back together. Um, you know, if that's based on, well, this is my house and this is where I live and this is where I'm comfortable, I don't think that by itself is a sufficient reason to end a therapeutic separation. Um, you really have to be able to answer together why should we be a couple? Um, what is it that we what is it that we ought to be doing together, should be doing together, want to be doing together? Um, I think that question has to be answered before ending the separation because that the answer to that question is going to be your North Star as you continue to navigate relationship issues. You know, maybe that the answer to that question is we're both recognizing right now that we're both really hurt and scared people, and there's nobody else in the world that knows me as well as this person does. And we want to help each other come through that. So you move back in and you know, you go through a honeymoon period of about a month and then you're at each other's throats again. And you bring that to couples therapy and your therapist says, well, how are you guys doing and being there for each other and helping each other heal? Well, we're doing crappy at it. Let's get, let's get reoriented. Um, any safety concerns and sobriety concerns that definitely need to be addressed before the end of a therapeutic separation. Um, Cause that's, you know, that, that's kind of issue number one. Are you safe to live with? Are you going to be betraying me behind my back. So, and you mentioned it, um, you know, like that, that something has changed. So to me, it's like they're, you know, having, you know, this is what I'm looking for to, to see change so that I'm not just coming back, you know, we're not just going to re-engage in the same way we did or the honeymoon period of 30 days or whatever. And then it's like at each other's throat. So, so that there would be recognizable, you know, things, but I also, I mean, I've heard so many people that are like a year and a half or two and a half years in therapeutic separation. And it seems like there's no plan. So it, to me, like you said, with a therapeutic separation, there is someone guiding the process and there would be a plan, not just, you know, we're going to do this now. And there are people that do therapeutic separations within a house, you know, they've got it divided up. So, so there's lots of ways to do it. It isn't just, you know, somebody's out of the house. Um, but, you know, having somebody out of the house with no plan, no re-engagement, no, you know, no working on things. And then all of a sudden, miraculously, things yeah. are supposed to be different. doesn't really work. Yeah. That's just a trial run for divorce. And I say oh, with, yeah. with my therapeutic separation couples is, there will be a cooling off period, but we're also during the therapeutic separation, we're going to enact a plan about re-engaging your relationship. So at some point you guys are going to be going on dates. At some point you guys are going to be spending time together. Um, at some point we're going to start easing back into that because the end of therapeutic separation isn't, isn't I, I haven't heard you or seen you or talked to you in three months and now you're moving back in. Um, you know, it's the, there's going to be a sensible ramp up um, to that so that we're not just, you know, hitting, hitting this cold um, and setting up for explosions and failures. But we really, I, I look at therapeutic separations as kind of putting the relationship on life support, um, but you don't jump off a of life support and, you know, run a marathon the next day. Um, successfully so yeah <laughs> okay i uh, have you noticed if there is any particular difference or factor associated with father and meshed men in my partner's family it was his mother who was a workaholic head of household and his father was the subordinate emotionally dependent and deeply enabling to his son while demonstrating peacekeeping over honesty is the solution to conflict thank you for your time that's a great question i haven't heard that one before yeah, I, you know, in all honesty, I haven't uh, researched that phenomenon much because uh, I think in our culture, we see the opposite more often. I will say uh, with any kind of parental enmeshment, there, there are some really common threads and, and that has to do with why it's problematic for the kid. Whether it's your father or your mother, 
um, you're, the term is parentified, you're given adult duties as a child, you're given adult responsibilities, adult emotions as a child. Um, you know, think about what would happen to a kid's physical development if every day you strapped on a hundred pound weighted vest to them, like their bones wouldn't grow right um, because that's not how it's supposed to work. It's the same thing emotionally with enmeshment. So whether it's a mother or a father, you're really going to get this compromised sense of identity. You're going to get this sense of uh, it's more important or it's, it's more critical for me to orient to and help others than it is for me to know what's going on with me. Um, you're going to get extreme loyalty ties. Loyalty is a great thing in relationships. Don't get me wrong. But when the loyalty moves to the point of I'm constantly choosing between myself and uh, my family, these relationships. Um, again, that's that 100 pound weighted vest because families and relationships are supposed to provide a place where we can grow and develop as individuals. And then the relationship is built on terms of who all is present here, who needs to be a part of this, not the other way around. The family and the relationship exists first and we mold everybody in this to fit that. Um, and that happens whether you're enmeshed to a, a father um, or a mother. Um, I would imagine that with, with mother enmeshment, there's a lot of issues around sexuality and sexual development because um, you know, mom was such a presence, such a force that this, this boy's identity, this boy's sexuality and, and male identity was not able to develop um, it was more, yeah, I'm a male, but only as much as mom is comfortable with that. So I'd imagine with father and mesh man, that could be a little bit different, but if dad is really muted and doesn't have that development himself, which I also see with mother and mesh man, it's not like dad was the shining example of manhood and mom just didn't let that be an influence. Um, there will be issues related to sexuality as well. Um, but, you know, that's something that actually I, I want to talk with, uh, Ken Adams about that and see what he's seen over the years or, or see what research he's seen over the years. Um, mother and mesh men are underrepresented of an, enough in the research. I, I bet father and mesh men are even lower. Uh, yeah. presentation there. And one of the things I really picked up on too was that um, uh, demonstrating peacekeeping over honesty is the solution to conflict. And I thought, I bet your partner has a really hard time, you know, saying any truth, you know, because it would always have to be, um, uh, I mean, classic setup for a, for an addict is like my emotions, my feelings can't can't take present. Pre, uh, precedence, the peacekeeping has to. So I have to deny my emotions. There isn't safe space for that. So, so what happens? Compartmentalization. You go act out and go numb out, and, so that I don't have to deal with that because that would be wrong. You know, I mean, all of that. So, um, so, so glad you're reaching out about this. You know, very important. But um, you know, do I believe that there's help? Yeah, absolutely. So hopefully he's getting support and help to uh, address those really valid needs and wounds so yep okay next question how do i help my betrayed partner get past the feeling that i am still gaslighting versus not remembering is that just a time intensive recovery or are there certain practices that i can utilize to help her feel safe and not gaslit as i am now being honest and can see that i that i do not see all things clearly you don't include how long you've been in recovery um and so but but talk in general please yeah, so I would say uh, number one, the, the easiest thing is don't gaslight um, and don't rely on your own self-assessment. I'm not gaslighting, I'm honest. Um, you know, it is such a pattern of dishonesty and hiding. This is where your 12-step your support group, if you're in a therapy group and your therapist can really, really help you dive into those patterns of deception and those patterns of self-protection. Um, I have yet to work with somebody who's not astounded by how deep that goes and how hard it is to change. Um, so, so that would be number one. If you want your partner to be able to heal from that, don't re-injure them in any way. Um, in essence, you have to become expert in um, self-deception and other deceptions so that you can monitor that more accurately. Um, number two is it's not enough to just stop 
um, that there has to be active repair steps taken. Um, so I think accountability is really, really important. It's not uncommon. A lot of the guys that I work with, there are really memory issues around acting out because it's not like they were completely present. A lot of times there's large degrees of associate, uh, disassociation um, when people are acting out. Um, however, those memories can emerge over time. Um, so, you know, if you and your partner have the agreement that I want to know this kind of stuff as soon as you know it, I don't want you to keep it back from me. As you have memories reemerge, you have to talk uh, in the way you and your partner have, have agreed to talk about that. Um, don't just skate by on them. Oh, I didn't remember, so it's not an issue. Um, I think being able to validate your partner's pain and frustration with you not being able to remember is really, really important. Um, th this is a difficult place to come from because I do think it's the right attitude. How do I help you? And that actually, that, that ought to be the way it is. That can become weaponized if you have any degree of impatience or anger around that. Gosh, when are you gonna get over this? If there's even a tone about it. If you think it, it will come through. Um, so making sure that you really work on holding that space of, you know, I, I really have a lot of work to do with you to help you heal from what I've done. Um, when you're not believing me, when you're upset with me, I get it. Um, I'm so sorry. Like you have to maintain that, that patient supported place, um, and work on any resentment you might have for this, this pain lasting as long as it is. Um, and, you know, to, to borrow a phrase that I learned from Tammy, get in the habit of telling the truth and tell it faster. Um, that's, that I think is the most direct way to helping your partners. Uh, I've heard another one of my CSAT colleagues refer to it as ridiculous honesty, not just rigorous honesty. Um, but if part of the wound is you have not had enough access to my internal world, my feelings, um, I will give you all the access you want to that. Um, and you don't even have to ask me for it. If you say you want to know what I'm feeling, I'll offer that. If you want to know what I'm doing in my day, I won't wait for you to ask. I'll give you that. Um, time is a really important in ingredient, but it's not time alone that heals. It's not about letting the dust settle. It's about proactively building a uh, very different relationship, a very different expectation from your spouse. Time and action. You know, I, I hear all the time, you know, it's been this long and, but he's not different using the heterosexual. He's not different. I'm like, so time didn't change anything because he's still being a jerk. So, so a couple things on this one. Um, uh, John mentioned it too, in community, working with your sponsor. You know, we, uh, we have a, um, a sex and porn addiction 101 work group. Uh, there's another one starting April 7th, but what it's fascinating that these guys, um, you know, like the memory, it changes because somebody says something or something's explained in a different way. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So, so just having the ability to hear and, and go, oh yeah, I did that too, you know, is helpful. Um, the one caveat to rigorous honesty or ridiculous honesty, please don't do vomit disclosures on your on your partner. Like I would just remember this and I'm going to tell you all the gory details because then it's like, bam, bam, bam. And this comes out of nowhere. So have a plan for as I remember things, you know, how like, should I talk to my therapist? Should I, I mean, how do we how do have a plan? So, and it's ahead. not just your plan. It really like your partner may not want to know the details or your partner may not want to know all of it. You really have to, you have to hash that out. You have to work that out with your partner. What do you want to know? And when do you want to know it? Um, and you have to stick to that because you can do a lot of damage by, you know, trying to speed up the uh, trust repair process with, I'm going to tell you everything. And really what you're doing is re-traumatizing your partner and ultimately showing, I actually don't pay attention to you. I'm in this for me. Yeah. And the being honest that I'm now being honest, I'm going to, I'm going to caveat that you're being as honest as you can in the moment. I believe that. Um, uh, but you know, addicts like lie about everything. So, so it's a completely different, you know, and it doesn't magically stop as soon as we stop acting out. Um, but I also, I'm wondering if you've done your timeline, you know, where are you in the steps and all that? Because man, a lot of stuff comes to light as you're starting to do the timeline, you go, Oh yeah, that fits into there. Oh, that fits into there. And as you're working with a professional and your sponsor and all of the, that. So, so 
what John said, and I agree, but the more you're working on you, you know, then you have more actions that demonstrate that I really am doing things differently. Focus, I, I hear this often too, is like um, addicts go, well, I want to, I want to help her or again, heterosexual, I want to help her. And guess what? The focus is all about fixing the situation, but I'm not worried. I'm not working on me and dealing with the underlying issues. So it, it's again, you know, uh, taking the focus off of what I need to do for me to be different. So to, to make a relationship safe, you actually have to be able to focus in three places simultaneously. What's going on with me, what's going on with you and what's going on with us. So an over-focus on what's going on with you, what's going on with my partner is not going to help the relationship any more um, than focusing on one of the other three. It's a three-legged stool and you have to develop all of them. Um, so, you know, run, I think about it as running the bases. If you want to get to third base, which is helping your spouse, make sure you've gone to what's happening with me, what's happening to us, what's happening with you, and keep that patrol up. Um, because all three of those held in balance and held accurately are, are what produces a safe relationship. So I mentioned the level one that starts April 7th. We also have a couples healing from betrayal workshop that is starting April 8th. And that is a facilitated, talks about communication. I mean, it talks about a lot of, you know, grieving losses together. That may be a fit for you too. So I put a link, it's on seekingintegrity.com. Um, and then you'll find it under online work groups and lecture series. So um, both of those, as always, you know, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com if you've got questions. So. Okay, next question. My husband and I have been working on trying to recover our relationship since my first discovery of infidelity in 2013. We have been married for 35 years. He seems to have a great he seems to have great difficulty in being completely truthful about things that have happened in the past. He chose to stagger disclosure for more than 5 years going further and further back into our marriage. He is still uh, he still has a lot of trouble with being honest about details, giving me a shared history. He goes into a trauma spiral and shuts down. What causes this to happen for him? And how can I help him with, to, uh, with understand what I need without causing so much trauma? Is there underlying mental illness that uh, needs to be addressed? Many therapists, some CSATs, he shuts down with them too. Is this all denial or cognitive dissonance? So that's a lot. Break yeah. it down for us. Yeah, um, with, without meeting your husband and assessing or meeting you and assessing, I actually don't know exactly what's going on. Um, so some, some things to keep in mind, some big things I hear in there is um, complete honesty in a relationship is actually a two-person uh, relationship orientation because we're concerned with fairness, equity, justice, shared power, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so when someone is dishonest as a mode in relationship where they hide or they keep things back, um, that, that person is doing a one person relationship orientation. I'm doing what works best for me. Um, my stance on that is that comes out of a lot of hurt that comes out of a lot of fear that can come out of, I never actually learned how to do a two way relationship thing. Um, so, uh, Part, part of the part of the goal or part of what, when, when you ask what can I do um, to, to help with that, uh, the right kind of couples therapist and right kind of couples therapy can help assess what's going on in the breakdown between the two of us. Um, I always say to um, anybody, addict or, or betrayed partner, when you want something in a relationship from your partner, how easy do you make it for the person to do that? Um, so some of that self-assessment, and that, that doesn't mean that it's your problem if your spouse isn't giving it to you, but if I want honesty, um, do I actually show my partner that I value honesty? Um, if I want transparency, um, do I work enough on my triggered responses that I don't, you know, get so out of control or, or so, you know, big in my fear response that it makes it hard for my partner to feel like transparency is what I really, really want. Um, so, you know, that, that question of to, to really support somebody, I think you have to understand what's going on and you have to know what your impact is on them. So learning a lot about attachment styles, um, learning a lot about um, what dissociation looks like. And the best source of that information, qualified therapists are great um, 
books are great, but, but actually getting into how does my spouse uh, show this, what's happening for them? Um, can I actually understand that? And can he understand that back and forth? Um, it's really, really difficult when you have high levels of dissociation, that's, that's difficult to work with. To, to me, the survival mechanism there is um, anything outside of me is overwhelming to me. So I go inside every time I'm too overwhelmed. Um, but the right, uh, the right couples therapist, the right approach can help a lot with that. Um, I guess the only other thing I can say is I'm really sorry that it's taken that road. Um, and, you know, keep, keep focused on what you're, you're wanting from the relationship, keep focused on what you can give without, you know, overextending, overspending, moving into resentment. Um, yeah. So in my, I mean, this, this is the kind of client we help at seekingintegrity.com. I talk websites at seeking integrity treatment program where we safely cocoon them. So, so what I hear is him shutting down, you know, and, and not being able to tolerate that. And we give them a safe space and clinical excellence to be able to do that. I am pained that you have been dealing, well, you've been dealing with this, you know, for 35 years, but, but you have been in you know, discovery and, and, uh, you know, not therapeutic um, disclosure, but you, you've been in this for eight years, seven, eight years. That's a long time. And for him to not be really making progress is, is painful for him, painful for you all the way around. You know, Dr. Rob talks all the time about if what you're doing isn't enough, then up the level. So, you know, so to me, I mean, you've been trying this, he's gotten qualified help. So to me, this seems like he needs a higher level of help. So, so if, you know, if you're willing, please do reach out to me. I sent you a chat too. So, okay. Next question. Speaking on memory, after acting out for over 25 years, my memory on all acting out behaviors and activities is clouded. My betrayed spouse feels that I continue to hide secrets and I'm not willing to give those items up. How do I help her work through the feelings of pain and distrust when I truly can't recall all the behaviors? First of all, just like we talked about with memory, don't try to convince her that you know what you're experiencing and why it's cloudy for you is what it is. Um, who knows what's going to happen as you uh, continue in your recovery? You could have some of those memories come back crystal clear. Um, so stay away from the, here's why you should be okay with this. Go to the pain. Um, go to the pain with your spouse. I imagine I can see it's really, really scary for you that you don't know the specifics that you want to know. Um, I can see that it's, it's really frustrating for you that I can't give you that. Um, you, you stay up on your side of the work. Um, I, I'm not of the opinion that recovering memory is the, you know, the sign that we're psychologically healing. Um, sometimes, you know, we just won't have the memory. Um, but if you're really listening to your partner, what she's saying is something like, I really need to know where you're at and I need to know enough about where you've been so that I can have confidence in where we're going. Um, so you stay focused on that thread. How do I, how do I provide this to her? Um, the, the way we heal the past isn't through going back to the past and somehow magically fixing it. It's getting it right in the future. So if you know that, uh, when you're not doing well, you tend to have these cloudy, can't remember it states, um, you would pay really close attention to that. You would in the moment, make sure that you're living in such a way and your, your recovery program supports you living in such a way where you don't go into those cloudy, I don't know what's going on places. Um, you, uh, you show her again and again through your actions that the intention is, uh, and, and the key is show her through your actions, your intention, don't tell her about your intention, but show her through your actions that I don't ever wanna be in a place where I can't tell you where I've been and what I've done before, because that's so unsafe for you. That, it's not fair for me to do that to you. Yeah, and that's a, and that is, it, um, I, you know, I would, if I had to recall every memory from my acting, I, oh my gosh, I would, you know, I'd be a complete fail. So, so it, it, you know, I, but I really think, yeah, your partner is looking for safety. 
action over time. And those things that I mentioned before, like, you know, hopefully you've done your timeline. Hopefully you're, you know, like I said, the level one again starts, those groups are, well, we had a level one and level two um, to work through those. And um, uh, they, we had enough requests that we created a level three. I mean, and I've had therapists that have commented it's a psychoeducational part. It really, it's not therapy, it's not treatment, but you know, it gives you more information and more insights and, and something may click where you go, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about, oh, that is cheating or I mean, whatever. I mean, it really gives a different perspective on things. And, and when you're hearing things that it really does help reduce shame too, because you're hearing other people talk about, you know, uh, those things as well. And that's true. in you know, in the 12 step fellowship and any of those, you know, the drop-in groups that we have. Um, and you talked about attachment wounds and I want to bring this one up too. So Troy Love does um, on Fridays, he does a group for addicts, males, um, uh, you know, on attachment wounds and, um, uh, he just started, so opposite of this one, he has now for partners um, that talks about attachment wounds because, you know, uh, even if you didn't have attachment wounds before, if you've been betrayed by someone, you know, there's betrayal wounds, abandonment wounds, whatever. So, so I love that he's created that. So next Thursday um, on this time frame, um, uh, there is that. So he has those alternating Thursdays, uh, um, alternating with John's webinar. So check that out if you're a partner as well. So, um, okay. Next question. I have started my amends with my partner, which has changed more like a disclosure from our relationship started. There is a lot of difference in our memories, but I am, um, but I am, and things, mm, things I can't answer because I can't remember accurately. My wife keeps asking where we go after the amends disclosure. I don't know the answer. Where should I look to get the answer to this? This is one of those terrifying, it sounds like there's not a professional involved and they're just yeah. sharing stuff. That's frightening. So step one, go to therapy. Um, Tammy is probably one of the best people in the country to talk to about who in my area can help me. Um, so, you know, reach out to Tammy and find some good qualified help. Um, because really um, disclosure doesn't solve everything and amends doesn't solve everything. This actually takes me to the 12 steps. And if you look at how they're outlined, you have steps eight and nine, which are about preparing for amends and making amends. You have step 10, um, which is about recognizing when you're wrong and promptly admitting that. Um, you have step 11, which is about renewing, you know, your, your spiritual connection with things bigger than you. Um, and then step 12 is about paying it forward. Um, the, the steps are not, uh, they're not like grades in school where you graduate and you've mastered that material and you don't need to go back. They're competencies, they're skills. Um, so the, the spirit of amends, the spirit of uh, four-step disclosure, the spirit of, um, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm not a peach to live with and I've got problems. Um, that's a cyclical thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, I think Tammy's nudge there in the beginning is get a therapist to help you decide where to go next, because that's very relationship specific. Um, and then the other part I'd put in there is, uh, challenge your perception that there are things that we do and then we're better. Um, because it's not like, you know, a year of a good exercise routine is going to make me fit for my life. Um, it gives me what I need then, um, but the needs continue and life continues. And um, for, for me, a lot of couples recovering, or couples recovery is about um, moving to a place where you can be adaptable and fluid with your relationship because your relationship is a living, breathing thing. It's always changing, always adapting. The needs both of you have are always uh, changing and adapting. So it's about learning how to uh, watch that, take care of that and keep pace with that. And I'm going to share from professionals, disclosure is one of the more challenging topics. Dr. Rob does a, a, a peer case consultation group every Tuesday for free for professionals where they come and they bring their cases anonymously, um, but they, they share where the struggles are. And I cannot tell you how often disclosure comes up as a topic, you know, because um because professionals can even be challenged with that. So, so this is like, you know, when they say, don't try this at home, 
you know, like this is really one of those, please don't try this at home. And a general therapist, you know, isn't going to have the tools. I mean, these are professionals who are trained to work with this yeah. and they're still asking questions. So, so it's very challenging and, and the professionals want to help you both have a foundation on which to build to move forward. 92% or something like that of, of, of couples surveyed who have gone through a good disclosure, like a therapeutic disclosure, you know, find that it was, you know, painful, of course, but helpful for the healing process. So doing it right, and I shouldn't say right or wrong, doing it with a professional within the, uh, the guidelines really makes a difference. Okay. Yep. Next question. Should a betrayed partner, I, the shoulds are always challenging. Should a betrayed partner automatically be in a 12-step program to heal just because the partner, the betrayer is an addict? Uh, my, so, and it continues, my addict husband seems to think that, and I think that in, is his way of getting out of healing the damage he has created. So that I, you need both of that. So, yeah, I, I don't think anyone addict or partner should automatically be in a 12 step group as a result. Um, there are lots of different options for support. There's lots of different routes to healing. And um, I see with a lot of couples, this issue of who should be in 12 steps and when, uh, it can almost become this red herring because the point is um, both of you have needs as a result of this. Sometimes uh, for, for a partner, for an addict, 12 steps is a really great ready-made way to meet a lot of those needs that you have. It's a support community and all of that. Your, may, your needs may be different and 12 steps may not be the right answer for you. Um, this is less of a process of, you know, like going and visiting your doctor and having your toenail fungus examined and the doctor saying, this is the prescription that you take. And it's much more of a, it's learning a lifestyle. So my recommendation would be, um, try on a lot of different things and see what works for you. I will say in, in, I'm comfortable saying a hundred percent of the cases of partners that I worked with. The all figured out by myself, I'm fine approach doesn't work well long term. Um, so it could be I'm going to read. It could be I'll do drop in groups like you're doing today. It could be I'll look into 12 steps. It could be I'll look into smart recovery. It could be I'll look into refuge recovery. I'll turn to, you know, religious and spiritual practices. I'll use yoga like the menu is so big of things that you can choose from. And you'll know it's working when it's working. I'm not consumed by this. I'm not consumed by fear. I'm not angry um, as, as much as I was before. I feel like there's a path forward. I can see what I need to do. Um, so um, I, I would say move out of that prescriptive argument. This is what we're supposed to do. And take the attitude of if there's anything out there that I can do to help myself, why wouldn't I explore it? Why wouldn't I see what, what I can do to make my life better from this point forward? I put the link in for these, but um, but we have pro-dependent aligned mm -hmm. support groups. Many partners go to some of the uh, 12 steps and find that it is codependent language, like you need to do this and, and all that. I just want you to have support. I'm glad you're here. I think betrayed partners deserve support and, and the community provides that so often partners are feeling like they're the only ones and there's no one else in this journey. And to have the, the knowledge that they are not alone, there's other people that are on the journey that will stand alongside them and, you know, and be on the path together. Well, great. Or have gone through all of this and survived it. You know, all of that is really good. Um, and, but I kind of go back to you, um, you know, what we were talking about earlier when John was talking about, you know, there's three things to do simultaneously, you know, for, for him to be working on what does he need to do to show you that he's safe, that he's working on his, you know, and, and to me, it's kind of like, and I'm, you know, I want you to get support, but you get to choose your own path. But like, if I'm the addict, I better be really focusing on what I need to do to, you know, make me yeah. different, not pointing the fingers at, and you need to do, you know, yeah. that whole, you need to do this stuff. That's what I, that's where I went with it. So absolutely. We are out of time. Thank you all for joining us. John, always great to see you. I'll look forward to seeing you on Super Saturday Recovery Summit as well. Um, uh, again, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. If I can be of help, point you in to different resources. And of course, our treatment program, uh, Seeking Integrity Los Angeles helps men 
heal, um, have life-changing experiences. And more importantly to me, I mean, I really appreciate that per the alumni, but when the partners say he's different, like we're talking about, you can see a change. That's what's really meaningful for me as well. So, okay. Thanks everybody. Bye. Hey guys.